Hey guys, how are you doing today? Welcome to the Life Podcast, episode eight. Our guest today was Dr. Sean Baker, a US Air Force veteran and world-renowned expert and advocate of the carnivore diet. For the last 18 months, this man has eaten nothing but meat. You heard that right, a doctor has eaten nothing but meat. He is additionally the world record holder for the 500 meter row for 50 plus and a former professional rugby player. Be sure to tune back in on Sunday for a live stream episode with two brothers who have started a candy company here in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And while you're at it, please do me a favor and hit that subscribe button down below and go ahead and ting that little bell next to it. Have a great day. Kind of switched over to a ketogenic sort of diet. Um, it's not really ketogenic at all. It's mostly carnivore and then I throw in green beans and nuts. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing. I, I think one of the things that makes a lot of these low carb, you know, whether it's paleo or low carb, high fat or ketogenic diet, I think a lot of the benefit just comes from quite honestly getting more a little more animal protein rather than we going from this high carb, you know, standard American diet or whatever. You're just you're just putting in a little more animal product, and I think it's better nutrition overall. Like I said, I'm not out there to tell everybody in the whole world you got to be a strict carnivore, but I think for many people it's very beneficial and it's very good for you know particularly people that are older and have developed big diseases uh, or, or medical conditions or gain too much weight or they got sore joints or whatever. It, it's a pretty good way to reset things, and I think people can do that for a while. And some people just feel great on it and they stay on it all the time, kind of like me. That's what I've been doing because I feel so well and perform so well but I think there's a lot of people that will find that uh, doing what you did for a couple of weeks couple of months maybe three four months and then they can find hey maybe I can tolerate a little bit of stuff maybe my guts healed up a little bit better and I can tolerate a few of these other things I don't think there's anything wrong at all with, it, with that with that approach yeah definitely and uh, that was one of the things I was gonna ask you about um, and kind of your approach to this <laughs> a lot of the I asked I reached out to some friends uh, you know people who ask questions a lot or more involved with the podcast and asked what they'd like to know and overwhelmingly the response was what's your daily routine uh you know, just with regards to diet or is it with regard to just my daily routine in general when you wake up everything yeah so i mean I, one thing i've noticed and a lot of people will, will also say the same thing you tend to sleep a little bit less and so instead of getting you know, eight hours, I find, I find that I do pretty well with six, and so I kind of wake up around five spontaneously. I don't need an alarm clock, kind of, you know, kind of probably probably more in line with, with our circadian biology, uh, probably around the light cycles is, is what it seems like. And I haven't really seen if I wake up earlier in the wintertime versus the summertime, so I haven't really paid attention to that. But I think there's something to that. And so I think I end up sleeping a little bit less, but I, but I feel extremely, extremely uh, uh, well-rested and... Uh, the uh you know so i end up you know waking up about five you know i may i may lay late because i don't have to get up until a little later i may lay around a little bit get up i've got some dogs need to take the dogs for a walk feed the dogs and then i'll feed myself and usually it'll be i don't always eat breakfast I'm, if i'm going to train work out early in the morning that i'm not going to eat before i train just because it's you know you, you don't want to sit there with a pound of, pound or two pounds of steak in your stomach and then go train real hard right after it just doesn't work real well so i well most days i i can work it where i can train over the lunch hour um, so, or maybe early afternoon if I'm lucky. Uh, so I'll, I'll typically, you know, eat, you know, a, a couple steaks, you know, and, and, and for me, like I said, I'm a, I'm a pretty big athletic guy. I've got a lot of muscle mass on me. So I end up eating typically about two pounds of steak for breakfast. Uh, you know, then I'll do whatever work I'm doing in the day. And, and then sometimes I'll get a training session in there. The training for me is generally about an hour. You know, it's pretty, pretty uh, productive hour for me. I'm pretty efficient, pretty, and I, and I go pretty hard. And I do that almost every day because uh, my recovery is real well, you know, is real, is real good actually. And, and so, and then, you know, later in the afternoon, you know, maybe four or five, six o'clock, I'll, I'll have dinner and it'll be something similar, you know, typically. That's most of the time. That's probably, I'd say that's 98% of the time. Sometimes if I'm a little hungry still, I'll eat a little more, you know, I mean, I might have an extra meal. I might throw another snack in there, but that's, that's pretty rare that happens. But but if I'm hungry, I don't hesitate to eat. Uh, sometimes, like I said, my diet, probably 90 Eight percent of it is just some kind of red meat, whether it's steak or burgers, and then occasionally I'll throw in um, some eggs every once in a while. Like for this morning, for I took my kids out to breakfast, we went out and I had some eggs with a couple of ribeyes and a little bit of bacon. Sometimes I'll throw a little seafood in there, not that often. Usually, if I'm cooking for other people, if I'm cooking for you know my family or my kids and they want shrimp or something like that, I'll, I'll cook that too, and then I'll have a few of those guys. Um, once in a while, I'll have dairy, and so sometimes I'll do that. You know, like uh, usually some high-fat dairy, whether it's cheese, cream. Sometimes I'll even try a little yogurt. And uh, but again, that's not you know those things are minor for me. You know, like I said, the the, the diet for me is. You know, about 98% meat. So, and I feel, and that's when I feel the best. I feel the leanest. I, you know, my my 
my, you know, I have the least amount of aches and pains. I sleep the best. Um, I feel I perform the best. My gym numbers seem to be the best. And more, I'm on just kind of the red meat. So that's what I've found. Okay. Okay. Um, Zan, I'll give you the next question. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think of a good What is – um? this is just kind of a general question because you've talked about training a lot. What does your training usually look like? I know you said you do like a little bit in the morning and sometimes in the afternoon. Yeah, well, you know, like I said, I'm in my 50s now, so I, I you know, I find that, you know, as much as, as, as it's about athletic performance, uh, for me, you know, I have certain athletic goals that I want to accomplish, and so I train specifically those things. But for, for just general purposes, I want to make sure I r- routinely include some decent strength work, so it's usually some compound heavy lifting like squats or deadlifts or some sort of pressing in there. I will um, try to make sure that I also include just some basic bodybuilding hypertrophy work, so that's, you know, that's the typical bodybuilder stuff, you know, curls and lat pull downs and rows and stuff like that. Hey, before you get too far into the episode though, go ahead and please hit that subscribe button down below. And go ahead and hit that, that little bell notification next to it. Otherwise, YouTube won't send you any notifications. That in a little higher rep range. And I, and I say that I vary my rep ranges are around depending. I think it's good to hit all kind of all of those different things. I think there's benefits from all facets we know now with some of the research that you can get. You can build muscle on lighter weights, you know, provided it's somewhere in at least 40% of your uh, uh, one rep max range, you know, if you, you know, if you can bench press 300 pounds, then, you know, you can make, you can do something with 120 pounds, provided you get enough reps and you go, you know, you basically go to failure. And then I also think conditioning is important. I do a lot of, you know, diff- two, really two different styles of conditioning. One, I'll do sprinting, all out sprinting, where it's truly 100% as hard as I can go, but I make sure I have enough um, uh, recovery in between those sets so that each set is, is 100% as opposed to something like a Tabata protocol where you're going all out but you only give yourself 10 seconds rest. What I found out when I did those things is by the time I got to the third or fourth rep, I really wasn't able to give all out capacity and so I think I, I lost some of the training value in that point. And so then I do the, the more sort of standard almost CrossFit metabolic conditioning workouts where you're just tired but I want to make sure that I'm utilizing um, exercise where I'm not going to get hurt. So instead of doing box jumps and snatches where, where the, the chance for error on those things can be pretty, pretty bad um, um, the uh, the uh, you know the safer exercises you know med ball slams kettlebell swings jumping rope burpees things like that you can do those things and not get you you have a reasonable chance of not getting hurt with those things even if you're tired and so that's how I kind of pattern those things and I don't I don't do a lot of a great deal of endurance work I find you know for me just going for a walk going for a hike I do that a couple times, you know, you know, certainly walking every day with the dogs. I'm not into endurance sports. I don't have a goal for endurance sports, so I don't really include much of it, you know, in my day-to-day training because it's just, it's just not going to benefit me uh, uh, long-term for, the, for, for what I'm trying to accomplish. Okay, okay. Um, and then you're recently in Iceland, right? Um, I was in Iceland, yeah, the, yeah, end of January, right? And um, you said something about they have a, uh, I mean, it's pretty significant uh, from my understanding, a half of a percent of their population is going carnivore. Yeah, so they've started, <laughs> there's a guy named uh, Ivor Ausford who, who was gracious enough to bring me out to Iceland host me. And I did a little presentation out there uh, with, with some of the folks, some of the local folks. When we had some kind of local meetups, had a nice carnivorous feast at one of the, res- one of the restaurants down in Reykjavik, uh, actually turn their whole menu into a carnivore menu for our group, which is kind of cool. But uh, yeah, they've got, you know, Iceland's only got about 300, 350,000 people, and they've got a group of carnivores that right now is about 14, 1,500 members uh, and growing every day. So they're picking up 25, you know, 10, 15, 20 people a day. Uh, and that's a, that's a significant percent of the population. And, and like I said, with Iceland, you know, the people there, you know, they live on this frozen island, right? And, and Traditionally, all they could get were pretty much animal products. They didn't have, they couldn't grow grow fruits and vegetables. You know, you're not growing bananas and coconuts in Iceland. It just doesn't happen. So these people have been living there since, you know, arguably 800 AD, perhaps a little earlier, depending on whose history you read. But they've been there continuously since then. They know they lived on a lot of lamb, sheep, seafood. You know. Eventually, they got cattle in there, and and you know, and then of course the dairy, and then they were able to import a little bit of grain product from Denmark, uh, but arguably that was generally used to feed their animals. And so they they traditionally, you know, in their culture, knew it was like going to Alaska and talking to the Inuit and saying, putting these people on a carnivore diet, well, they're going to be like, yeah, no big deal. We'd, we've done that anyway for thousands of years. And with Iceland having that background, it's kind of interesting, as we know, a lot of the world's strongest man competitors 
you know, they've only got 300,000 people, but they've taken eight, eight World's Strongest Man's titles, uh, and, and arguably they may get another one with, with Thor Bjornsson, you know, or half the one. Um, if, uh, you know, we'll see. He won the Arnold, so we'll have to see what happens in World's Strongest Man this year, depending on Brian, Brian Shaw response. Hang on just a second. Hang on, guys. Well, anyway, so we're talking about Half Thor. You know, we've got, you know, obviously we had uh, Magnus for Magnuson and, and John Paul Sigmarsson won the uh, World's Strongest Man title. Uh, they, uh, they've also, interestingly, you know, they've got quite a few of the CrossFit champions. You know, I think, uh, oh, what's the guy, Thor's daughter? I can't remember her first name now. I think she won her two titles. Um, and then, you know, the interesting thing about Iceland is that life expectancy, they have a tremendously high life expectancy despite a diet that is pretty low on low in fruits and vegetables overall. You know, that was one of the things that, you know, when they raided these countries, they said, well, despite the fact that Iceland needs very little fruits and vegetables, it's because they can't, they don't have access to them. You know, they've got to import it all. Um, they live really long. And in fact, if we look at uh, folks who live over 100, uh, particularly with the males, Iceland has either the number one or the number two highest amount of males reaching 100 years of age than anywhere else on the planet, which I think is pretty remarkable on some people. And, and again, that's an all animal-based diet. And I know a lot of uh, people try to determine on what to eat based on epidemiology. I don't think that's a very way, good way to do it. The folks that are proponents of you know plant-based diet will always put out, you know, they'll say, well, look at the Okinawans, look at these other blue zones. But, but then we look at places like Hong Kong where they eat prodigious amounts of meat. I mean, they eat more meat than we do in the U.S. and they live extremely long. They, they, they live longer than, you know, again, almost anybody in the world, arguably number one in the world, and they've got seven million people and they want to they compare it to a blue zone of, you know, 20,000 people and say, well, these guys are the best because they eat vegetables. And so I, I, you just can't use that data to inform yourself about life expectancy. And, and then in general, you really can't use any of that because there's so many other factors that go into this stuff. There's genetic components. You know, when we got these little blue zone populations, we've got relatively genetically homogenous populations in a particular social setting, you know, with, with uh, you know, a climate, you know, a work environment, so, you know, a, a, a cultural support system. So you can't replicate all those things. Diet, in, in fact, has not a great deal to say about life expectancy. You know, it's, there's the other factors probably have a bigger role than uh, than, than diet does. And so that's why the number one reason why people live a long time is if they live in a wealthy country for the most part. You know, even though we knock the United States about, um, you know, our, our bad habits and our crappy diet and our standard American diet, we still have a pretty decent life expectancy. It's not as good as places, some of the other places, but we're still up there quite well. And if we compare that to places like you know, India, where, you know, most of the population is vegetarian or traditionally has been, they have a very poor life expectancy. You know, it's 10 years less than the United States. Uh, and that's largely because it's a poor country. You know, there's a lot of poverty in there. And any place you go that has a lot of poverty, you're going to find lower life expectancy. And that's the same thing because one of the things that, you know, when we talk about Inuit and we talk about their diet and they say, well, they didn't live as long as the other Canadians. They, they live 10 years less. Again, the Inuit are living in abject poverty. And so if you live in abject poverty, you're just not going to live very long. So diet doesn't really, diet has very little to do with life expectancy. And so I think that people that want to impart uh, some causation to diet and life expectancy, you, you really can't do that. That was uh, one thing. I spent the uh, January of 2017 in Vietnam, um, and I noticed that was one thing there was, uh, it may have just been what they fed us, but our diet was mostly meat. Um, and people there, I mean, obviously they're not as healthy as people in the United States. A lot of that's socioeconomic, um, but they, I mean, they're much more flexible than people in the United States, much happier. They seem to have more energy. Everybody wakes up early. Um, do you think that might have anything to do with the fact that they eat a decent amount of meat? Well, you know, again, my, my belief is meat is very nutritious. I think it's good nutrition. You know, I think we, you know, we have essential amino acids and we have essential fats and we get those, uh, you know, ideally for meat and the ideal ratios that we need them. And I think when your nutrition is good, you generally perform better, you generally feel better. And so that probably has uh, something to do with, again, I don't know for sure what the traditional Vietnamese diet is, you know. Uh, you know, if you look at any indigenous population, I mean, they will overwhelmingly when they can get it, select meat. 
I mean, if you look at any of these populations, they will overwhelmingly, you know, that's what they go for. That's what they hunt. You know, even these, these you know, they'll eat any animal they can get. You know, if we look at, you know, the uh, hobs out of uh, Tanzania and, and Kenya, I mean, they, if they're not getting meat, they're not, they don't feel like they're eating. You know, they, 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 they gather what they can. And the other thing that people sort of, sort of try to conflate modern hunter gatherers with what our ancestors ate. And so we have to realize we don't live in the same world anymore. You know, if we back up the clock, 20,000 years ago. Now we're in the middle of an ice age and there's lots of big animals. I mean, there's lots of these big ruminant animals, mammoth, elephant, you know, rhinos, you know, all these, you know, North American, you know, camels and these big, big ruminant animals everywhere. And there's not that many people. And so the food is, uh, you know, reasonably plentiful, you know, and, and again, you figure that we learned how to kill elephants and mammoths a million and a half years ago, we know Homo erectus did that. So humans have known how to do that for a long period of time. And if you think about it, if you guys are stuck out in the wilderness somewhere and, you, and you, they give you a spear and they say, okay, go get something. You've got these big, giant, fatty, slow-moving animals versus all these super fast-running antelope and birds and, and stuff like that. You know what are you gonna what are you gonna do? You're gonna go. You're gonna hunt the damn big ones and kill them, and, and then you've got this food for months. And so that's what we did. That's what humans did, and that's what our our ancestors did. And there's pretty good, you know, archaeologic and anthropologic data that shows that, you know, they did pretty well with that stuff. And it wasn't that we were feast or famine. The real famine started happening once we developed agriculture. That's when we started, humans started undergoing famine. And so the whole thing about we had to fast all the time, I don't think that necessarily lines up with, with much of the uh, uh, anthropology. I think we have some good, pretty good evidence to show that humans were pretty successful hunters. We had plenty of uh, megafauna to eat. And it's not until, you know, either we wiped out those animals and it's pretty clear, there's pretty clear evidence that we had a big role in wiping out much of the megafauna across the world. We look at everywhere where man settled in different parts of the world, whether it's Australia or, you know, the Pacific Islands or, uh, you know, North America. I mean, everywhere we went, within a few thousand years, these big megafaunal animals disappeared. Now, some people will argue there's some uh, climate change that impacted that, and probably it did to some degree. But it, but whatever it was, we played enough role that as we killed, you know, you know, some of these big animals. You, if you kill like a certain percentage of them, like three percent of them, they, they end up dying. And there's there's some interesting metrics on that. They have to have a certain uh, reproductive. Uh, uh, percentage to survive as a species. I think we ended up wiping that out. And so uh, that is one of the reasons I think, you know, intuitively it, it feels very good to eat a, a, you know, a fattier cut of meat. That's why those ribeyes and some of those other uh, short ribs and some of those other cuts of meat taste so palatable to us is because I think we evolved with those bigger, fattier animals. And now we don't have, you know, it's not convenient to go eat elephant meat anymore. You kind of get in trouble if you do that. So we're not allowed to do that now. And so the closest thing we have right now are, you know, things like cows that we, we breed and we, and, and they're, they're, they have enough fat, particularly the fattier cuts. And that's why most people that go on a carnivorous diet tend to steer towards the fattier cuts. And I think that's why the, uh, you know, the hunters that we do know, the, the, the Plains Indians, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, indigenous population of the Arctic, they always selected the fattier animals because they knew how to identify those things, and those are the things they wanted to kill. Okay? Uh, yeah, um, so does that kind of relate to why you stick to mostly like red meat? Because um, I noticed you said like even most of the meats you mentioned were red, and you didn't say anything about like, chicken or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a preference thing. It's a satisfaction thing. And I think if you talk to any, any other people, for the most part, there are a few, a few exceptions to this, but the vast majority of people that do this over a long period of time, particularly as you get down to a relatively lean, stable body weight, you just need a little more fat. And I think that uh, that is why, uh, you know, red meat is, I think by and large is more nutritious than things like chicken or pork. And if we look at, you know, for instance, U.S., meat consumption, our meat consumption over the last 40, 50 years has gone, stayed the same and maybe gone up arguably just a little bit, but the vast majority of that increase has been eating chicken and our red meat consumption has dropped about 40% since about the mid 1970s. We peaked, we peaked around 1977, 75, something like that. And we've dropped something like 30 to 40% of our red meat consumption has gone down in the US. And it's interesting is as our red meat has gone down, our incidence of diabetes, heart disease, well, well not heart disease, but diabetes and obesity has gone up. And so it's kind of interesting when people want to try to impart cause as red meat being the cause of that, 
you know, that sort of fact should at least make you question that pretty pretty significantly. But yeah, red meat to me is just very particularly satisfying. I think most people, you know, you know, when you think about it, I'm going to eat a, I'm going to eat a boneless chicken breast or I'm going to eat a steak. Which one's going to be more satisfying? Almost hands down, people are going to say the steak. And I think it, I think again, I think that goes back to uh, just kind of our primitive or- origins, and I think it goes back just a, a deep visceral. Uh, satisfaction that we get with that and you know red meat has you know carnosine and carnitine and creatine and alpha lipoic acid and and heme iron and you know all these b vitamins and you know all this wonderful stuff that we need and and we and and makes us feel good i think it's a i honestly think it is a you know this is the thing i talk about from time to time is i think it, it helps with mental health as well and i think a lot of people just feel often mentally better you know when they when they do that let me ask you um, what, one quick point on the uh, 3% thing you mentioned earlier, where it takes 3% possibly to um, wipe out a whole population. Um, you, you mentioned you don't know the exact percent. I, I obviously have no clue what the percent is, but it ties into something interesting. I'm a big follower of Jordan Peterson, and uh, that's as Zan knows. And uh, basically, so your top uh, 20% is going to produce 80% of the results and that continues all the way up the hierarchy or the uh, competence hierarchy if uh, you will and for example um, so he uses lobsters so the most competent lobster will reproduce the most um, exponentially increasing as they become more and more dominant in their hierarchy so if humans take out the very top the head honcho and then maybe one or two below him all of a sudden you lose a lot of reproductive and also you're going to have all the other animals um, and the example of the lobster in uh, Jordan Peterson's most recent book he says their brain effectively melts and forms a new um, what's below a prey mentality um, so that could be a possibility there with the wiping out of the 3% um, and then I was going to ask um, I'm blanking on it now what are we talking about well, actually, I know you brought up Jordan Peterson. You know, his his daughter has switched over to a, to a fully carnivorous diet, Michaela, and uh, actually yeah, that was it, actually. Yeah, and, and so she's done that, and then I guess actually Jordan Peterson himself has actually started. So that's uh, uh, he's you know he's still having some residual anxiety issues because he was on a kind of basically a meat and, and leafy green vegetable diet, and he's still fi- finding that he still has issues with anxiety, and so I know he is as of about. Maybe a week or two ago, he has uh, switched over to carnivorous diet. I have no idea, you know, how he's how he's fared so far. It'll be interesting to see if he if he comments on that down the road. But uh, so far, that's what I've seen. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot. It's it's something interesting. Um, and then I was gonna say, often when people go to doctors these days and they have uh, say high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and I've seen your uh, thing on high cholesterol where you say you know it's it's just a measure and it's fluctuating. Um, and so when you go to see the doctor, they're going to say you have high cholesterol. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, but they tell people to stop eating so much red meat. And then I hear people, they say they had a heart attack because they ate red meat. Um, now, your diet is almost entirely red meat and you're in good health and haven't had a heart attack. Um, yeah, so far I've not had a heart attack. <laughs> would, you, would you say that the it's the combination of red meat with those carbohydrates and the other garbage that's in the regular diet that causes that? Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the we we sort of oversimplify stuff. You know, there is, uh, you know, there's there's an association. It's fairly actually a fairly weak association, although, although often consistent. That higher cholesterol levels are, are can be associated with a higher degree of uh, coronary artery disease or atherosclerosis. Um, but we can't, you know, I think there's a lot of controversy around whether that's truly causal or not. You know, there's a lot of people like when you use an animal model to create atherosclerosis, okay? What they have to do first to those vessels is they have to take a burr, and they, they run it up and down the vessel to scratch it up, to irritate it, okay, to cause damage. And then only after that has occurred can their cholesterol can come in there and deposit in there and, and, and form one of those plaques. And so a lot of people will uh, will sort of uh, compare cholesterol to a, to a patchwork material. It's trying to... It's trying to mitigate the damage and so you have to have the inflammatory damage that occurs first right and so in the absence of inflammatory damage there's no real good evidence showing that cholesterol of any any level will will cause by itself 
you know, these atherosclerotic problems. Now, how do we get the damage in the first place? You know, does high cholesterol by itself cause damage? Almost undoubtedly not, right? So the things that potentially do cause damage are things like oxidized omega-6 uh, uh, oils, you know, or omega-6 fats. You know, we find those particularly in uh, uh, processed seed oils. And so we, we introduced processed seed oils into our diet around 1910 with the invention of Crisco. And so since that time, we've also, you know, we've seen this dramatic increase in heart disease. And then there's also things like, you know, other inflammatory things in the diet. A lot of people will have issues with uh, processed grains. You know, wheat in particular can be one. Sugar seems to seems to be another uh, uh, driver of this. So we've got this combination. You know, I think the perfect the perfect food to develop heart disease is probably the donut. You know, because it's processed, you know, it's processed flour, grain, uh, sugar, and some kind of vegetable oil. You know, that, that's probably the, the, the perfect heart attack food. And so what happens is, um, but if you have this underlying inflammation and this underlying inflammatory problem, probably any fat added to the diet is probably not helpful. And so what happens is, you know, when you go on a diet where you don't have inflammation, you know, and, and I would say based on my experience and experience of now thousands of other people, going on a carnivorous diet, the inflammation goes away. You know, and, and we've seen that repeatedly clinically with things like joint pain, digestive issues, and other things that are related to inflammation, you know, skin conditions. And then we've also seen it in the lab bags. We've seen their C-reactive protein, which is, you know, it can be a decent marker for inflammation in people that adopt a carnivorous diet. Now, that can be that can go up and down based on a number of different things like uh, a hard workout, you know, a, a cold, a stressful event. So it's not always perfectly reliable, but in general, the trend has been very low for things like C-reactive protein and, and inflammation. And so, uh, you know, all the epidemiology and the observational study looking at people that eat meat, well, those same people are usually the guys going to McDonald's and eating the greasy French fries, fried in vegetable oils, and, and eating the sugary shakes, you know, and, and the, and the, and the the, in the buns and all that stuff and so we've got this horrible epidemiology which you know never should be used to to impart causation but it's always done in the media and then we've got this huge bias that's developed from that and then we have people that are trying to prove it based on the epidemiology rather than saying let's disprove it based on the epidemiology and they don't they don't really do that well and so one of the nice things about this carnivorous diet is all these things that red meat supposedly does causes inflammation causes you know obesity and weight gain causes uh, gout causes you know you know all these you know all these other problems when you only eat meat all those things go away so it's kind of the opposite effect okay okay um, and Zen, you want to yeah, I'll do the next one. Um, so, I mean, obviously, you've made this diet like a big, big part of your life. It's definitely what you're known for. Do you got do you do you have like a like a goal you're trying to reach, like an end goal with the diet or in general? Well, I mean, my in, you know in goal. My personal goal is just to be as healthy and active and, and you know, break records athletically as I can and, and be around for a long time. You know, it's not like I'm out there uh, doing anything. You know, it's not like I haven't tried all kinds of other diets over the, over the years, and this honestly is what makes me feel best. And I just think that's a message that people should have. I think there's two main things. You should find a diet that works really well for you. You should be extremely objective about how you just determine uh, – uh, you know if the diet's working or not and you've got it there's a, there's a number of things you can do to do that and I think a lot of these subjective things like uh, you know how do you feel you know how do you perform you know how, how's your digestion your mental health your skin your libido your uh, you know your joints your musculoskeletal how, how you gain how do you can gain muscle your body composition all those things are extremely important you know it's, it's hard to quantify that stuff but it's still extremely important you can look at trends and then there's things you can look at uh, you know, tissue-wise, you know, I know I, I've been very controversial about saying that blood is not that particularly compelling for making long decisions based on, uh, you know, for making decisions based on your health. I think there's a lot of physiology that you have to understand and be, to be able to interpret some of these uh, laboratory results and, and, and understand what the uh, uh, the actual clin clinical situation is and put things into context. You know, and a lot of physicians don't even know how to do that because they've just had it beaten into them that it's black and white and uh they do not um you know they don't have time they, just, they honestly do not have time to figure it out and so it's it's kind of interesting stuff but yeah but so i think the, the end goal for 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 me in general for myself is just personal health performance and the end goal for what i want to do with this is just show people that there's you know you have to step outside the box 
find out what works for you. You know, so much of the medical science we have is, is just not that reliable for a number of reasons. You know, it's a lot of the stuff we're unable to answer the questions that we'd like to answer because it's just impossible to do with nutritional studies. There's a lot of bias in some of these studies. There's a lot of, you know, you know, financial interest, particularly by um, food and or drug companies to uh, promote a particular uh, study. You know, there's a nice article Jason Fung wrote on how much of uh, all the clinical research out there has been just sort of if a, if a drug company bonds a study and it doesn't get them the result they want, they throw it out. They never, it never, it never sees the light of day. And so, you know, we have all these studies where, you know, say 50% of the studies show it's bad and 50% of the study is good. Well, they throw out 95% of the ones that say it's bad. So now it looks like, you know, 92% of the studies say it's good. So it's, it's just a, it's kind of a mess. And I don't know who to trust. And I don't think people know it either. And I think people are finding out that, you know, maybe the best answer is just to experiment on yourself and see what works. Um, with with that, do you think there's anyone out there that would genuinely benefit and possibly have a vegan diet as the best diet for them? Uh, I mean, from a physiological standpoint, I don't think it could be the best diet. I think it can be a better diet for a lot of people, undoubtedly. You know, there's a lot of people that, uh, you know, they come from an absolute garbage diet of, you know, the standard junk food diet, and they go on a vegan diet, and they do feel better. And there's no doubt about that, you know, and I think... Uh, uh, you know, if you eliminate like the things we talked about, the processed grains, the sugars, and you go on what they call a whole food plant-based diet where you, where you eliminate all that stuff, of course you're going to do better. You're going to struggle to meet a lot of the uh, essential requirements. You know, there's things we don't even know that are required coming from a meat-based diet yet, I think, that, that we may not hit. And I think long-term... Um, you know, some of them may, be, may do pretty good overall. I don't think it'll be optimal for them. I don't think they'll, they'll, they'll reach their, their peak physical performance. I think there's a, there's a sort of a trend of a lot of athletes trying it now. And I think if you look at these people long term, we see repeatedly athletes will try it for about performance and health. A lot of them will step away from that. There's just countless examples of athletes that have tried vegan diets, you know, did well for a year or so, and then they gave it up because they didn't do it. And I think that's something that, uh, you know, people confuse youth and athletic potential for health. You know, when you're young, you can eat anything. You know, there's a, there's a lot of guys breaking records eating a, a junk food McDonald's diet in the NFL, you know, and so that, that's obviously not a good diet. And so you can do that with a vegan diet too. And But again, after a while, it catches up with you. And I think if we watch, if we watch these people that, you know, say they're vegan and they sort of, you know, they'll they'll either start to drift away from that where they'll have kind of quote unquote cheat days once a week. I'm vegan, but yeah, I eat I eat eggs and a little bit of chicken fish once a week and still call themselves vegans. Or they eventually just say, hey, look, you can do like that like uh, MMA fighter, heavyweight guy, M Frank Mir did that. You know, he did that for a year and he said, I lost my strength. I kept getting beat up. I was injured more easily. And I think, you know, even though you're still at a high level because you've already attained this high level of athleticism, you know, another one another one of the sort of ones that vegans like to bring up is Kendrick Ferris. Kendrick Ferris is a phenomenal Olympic lifter. You know, he's, he's a U.S. record holding Olympic lifter. But you have to remember, he set that record as an omnivore, as a meat eater. And so he went two more years as a vegan, and he's made almost no progress. You know, and he's in the prime of his life. He's in his mid-20s where you should be making a lot of progress. He's made no progress. He went to the Olympics. He had a pretty bad performance. You know, he's well, he performed well below what he could have performed at. So you have to question if the, if the, if the veganism has, has negatively impacted him. So... Uh, but yeah, can it be better for people? Yes, it can. Again, can it be optimal and ideal? I would say, you know, not from a physiological sense. For some people, from a psychological standpoint, it's the optimal diet for them because they have a lot of uh, ethical, you know, belief in that. And if that would make them mentally okay, if they're okay with, you know, thinking they're saving the world by not eating cows and instead they're, you know, again, any diet, no matter who you are, no matter what you eat, there's going to be animals that are going to be killed to produce that diet. It's just no way around that. And if they want to say, I don't have to eat the flesh, but I'm, not, I'm guilt free because I'm eating these, you know, these strawberries that were grown in South America in January and imported across the world, and we displaced all these animals to put to plant that field and so on and so forth, then so be it. But I think they're just kidding themselves. It's, it's, it's very hypocritical. Mm -hmm. Um, one question that uh, came to mind while you were talking about kind of different athletes. I know you work on a, uh, you were talking about your workout 
lifts um, earlier, and I was wondering because I'm more of an endurance athlete. I like to do like uh, I'm a big runner. I like to run a lot, and I wondered if you know like how the reps differ between athletes who are working on like strength versus endurance athletes. Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly there are a number of endurance athletes that, that do a carnivorous diet that are doing doing pretty well in this. And, you know, there's a guy named Charles Washington who's been a carnivore for 10 years now. He's a marathon runner. He's I think he's right at the point where he's about to, you know, he's about to get to the Boston Marathon qualification stage. And so that at least that's pretty decent. You know, I know he's hitting personal PRs uh, with that. I know there's a number of other, uh, you know, my, I, have my, I have a podcast with a guy named Zach Bitter who is uh, – uh, he is, I don't know if you're aware of him, he's, he's got the uh, world record for the 12-hour run. He's got the American record for the 100-mile run. You know, so he's a, he's a high-level guy. And he is, uh, while he's not completely carnivorous, he is very low-carb. Uh, he's been ketogenic for a while. And he's been playing with carnivore now for the last several months and has noticed an, an, a very significant improvement in his, uh, his recovery capacity. And so... Uh, my dogs want to eat. They're carnivores. I get them. <laughs> They're in their ground. I make they want to eat. Um, but you know the differences. I think the things that I see. You know, if you look at the different energy systems. You know, if you're if you're if all you're doing is weightlifting, right? You don't really touch much sugar. I mean, it's all this creatinine phosphate system. So it's all this one to two, three second stuff. You know, an Olympic lift takes a second. You know, power lift might take two, three seconds. So you're not really touching the glycogen. And so what I found is a lot of people will get stronger uh, pretty quickly on this diet. You know, initially they might not for for a few weeks, but generally most people will say they get stronger pretty pretty quickly. And so uh, I think there's a number of reasons for that. Again, we talk about some of the performance enhancing things that are in meat, like carnitin, uh, which is composed of beta alanine and histidine. Which, and beta alanine is a supplement as well as we know creatine. You know, and then all the all the protein and the, and the heme iron and stuff. Uh, from a distance standpoint, I think there is that, ad- 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 that advantage to becoming adapted to fat, you know, as you get on those longer distance runs. And the other thing I think with a carnivorous diet is you, you have access to a little bit more glucose too, because I think you have this you know, a little bit higher level of gluconeogenesis to support what you're trying to do. And then there's the in-between stuff where you want to talk about this short bouts of glycolytic activity, like what I do in the rowing machine, where I'm rowing as hard as I can for a minute or a minute and 30 seconds and breaking world records in that distance. So that's highly, highly anaerobically glycolytic. And, you know, I, my body has, has, has adapted to that. I have a higher resting glucose to, to meet those demands, even though I'm extremely insulin sensitive. And so I have to explain uh, this in a video because there's all these people that are going, well, your glucose is high, you're going to die. And I'm like, no, you don't understand the, the pathophysiology and the physiology. So, But there's another athlete who's a pretty interesting guy, a guy named Owen Franks, who is a New Zealand All Black. He is a uh, rugby player of the, of the highest level in the world, you know, the New Zealand All Blacks. And if you look at rugby, what rugby is, it's a, you know, it's a 90-minute uh, you know, or 80 minute. Gosh, it's been so long I played. I can't remember now. Anyways, what's that? It's basically yeah, but it, yeah, basically. So it's just these high bouts of you know high levels of activity and then constant running. And so, and he is doing well, very well on a zero carb uh, diet. In fact, I'm going to have him on my podcast in the in the coming uh, weeks, hopefully. But so I've got examples of people at least. Anecdotally, people doing very well and performing at very high levels uh, on this diet, and so I think it's you know I think it's just a matter of adaptation, you know, giving your body enough time to adapt, and that may be a period of several months. You know, when I went on a ketogenic diet, because I did a ketogenic diet for a couple of years before I switched to carnivore, and it took me it took me a good four to six months to adapt on a ketogenic diet from an athletic standpoint before I really started to pick up. And then the same thing, even going from keto to carnivore, I probably, I say it took me about two more months uh, to really find that, you know, find that point where I started to turn things around and see uh, pretty remarkable improvements in strength and and, and power output and overall performance. And I think part of that had to do with, you know, again, you guys are younger, so you don't have to deal with this stuff. But as you get older, you have these aches and pains and joints start getting achy. And those things went away from me and that allowed me to train you know, at a very high level, very hard, and very frequently. And so the combination of being able to do that stuff, train hard, you know, at high intensity, with high frequency, with good recovery, you know, results in better performance. And so that's what I've seen. Okay. Um, let me ask, uh, with with that joint pain uh, going away, is, is there something specific you see in kind of the chemistry of the crossover? And uh, kind of the two-part question, do you 
uh, recommend any supplements for people who would be interested in switching from their regular diet to a ketogenic diet or a ketogenic to a carnivore or their regular diet to a carnivore diet while they're in that in-between period? Are there any supplements uh, which you would okay. Yeah, so I'll talk about the joint pain. So I think there is a, uh, you know, uh, as I said, I had about 20 years of orthopedic surgery and I would see patients and, you know, some of them every once in a while would tell me if I eat something, you know, my joints would hurt. And I, I would kind of dismiss that as, you know, you're kind of a crazy person and, you know, it doesn't really matter. And But as I as I started to explore with my, my own self and then see it in, in different patients, yeah, I saw that, uh, again, we talk about inflammation and I think a lot of joint pain uh, is it's not all wear and tear and mechanics. You know, as, as an orthopedic surgeon, you're given these tools and you've got these angles to measure and these, you know, force plates and, you, you know, there's all these things you can do to sort of correct the mechanics. But the underlying pathology really starts with the biology. You know, if the biology is off, you know, you have this infl inflammation and then the mechanics become amplified. And it's just like having a, uh, you know, you know, if your tire's off balance, it's going to wear a little bit. But if your tire is... Uh, you know, made out of the wrong substance, you know, it's going to wear a lot quicker, you know, it's, it's and, and that's what's happening. I think these people's, you know, their, their cartilage and some of the other things, or if you want to look at the tendons, the proteins in there are being damaged by things like, you know, advanced glycation end products. And there's a number of other things that go into that. And I think it's all related to diet. And so I think by eliminating some of those things, and I think they vary from person to person, but again, certainly some of the things we already mentioned, the advanced uh, glycation end products from high sugar diets, the, the probably advanced, uh, you know, lipid end products you know, from, from the, you know, the, the fatty, the, the, the oxidized, you know, seed oils those things probably play a part in that and so that's what's going on with with the joint pain um the as far as the supplements go you know i think that there's a couple situations you know if you have a condition where and a lot of people have this where they'll they'll not be able to absorb certain nutrients you know uh, one of the classic examples is people start to lose the capacity to produce hydrochloric acid in their stomach a lot of people have been put on medications that will prevent that that will impede the ability to digest you know some of the food particularly the meat meat that's why we have a hydrochloric acid based digestive system you know our, our, our gastric ph tends to be about 1.1 to 1.5 something like that in a normal healthy human being uh, and as long as that that remains very acidic we can we can digest meat very well now some people lose that capacity so some people you know they might have to supplement things like hydrochloric acid or something called betaine which which can help produce you know help them with their acid production uh, electrolytes a lot of people as they go on a low carb or carnivorous diet if they come from a higher carb diet they will lose a lot of electrolytes you know and that's why a lot of people lose water weight you know because what happens is you don't spike as much insulin insulin normally on the the effect of insulin on the kidneys normally is to cause uh, reabsorption of sodium and when, with that sodium comes water when you're not producing as much insulin you're going to lose some of that sodium water and so some people will find that uh, supplementing with electrolytes can be helpful so people will argue that vitamin d might be something helpful particularly if you live in colder climates um so i think those things are okay i, I find that a lot of people that do this long term find that they they no longer need uh, to take supplements but certainly during the transition period uh you know I, again I, your audience is mostly college folks I, sus I suspect so you're probably not going to have too many people that are going in for uh, like gastric bypass patients you know those are people that you know part of their digestive tract has been removed you know and they've lost some of this absorption capacity and so those guys often have to take supplements the rest of their life and so if you have a known deficiency you know then, then probably supplementing at least initially might be of benefit okay um and I know you and Zan both got to get out of here pretty soon. Um, and I, I wanted to, I, can I take two? Yeah, can I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take two questions. Um, sorry. Um, but uh, I was going to ask about um, your time working with uh, the nukes and then um, what's something that uh, you don't really get to talk about that often because people are always asking you about carnivore. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I was a uh, I was I was in the Air Force twice. It was kind of funny back in let's see ninety two. I got back from New Zealand playing rugby, and I wanted I wanted to continue to play rugby. So I so I at that time there wasn't really good opportunities in the U.S. to play rugby. So I went in the military because they had a pretty good rugby program. So at that time um, I went through officer training school, uh, graduated with honors, and then 
you know, you got they were they were saying you could be a you know, nuclear guy. All the pilot positions were being banked at the time. Back then, they were they were shutting down the pilot program. So I said, oh, okay, I'll go. I'll go launch nuclear bombs. That's fine because I'm going to play rugby anyway. So I did that for about um, nearly five years, I think. No, four. Can't remember how long. Four, four and a half, five years, something like that. Uh, you know, I went to training out in Vandenberg Air Force Base in Cal- Cal- uh, California, learned how to launch nuclear me- nuclear missiles, and then spent about four years up in Wyoming, up in Cheyenne, Wyoming, which is the windiest, coldest place on the planet. Yeah, it's pretty cold in the wintertime. But, uh, but I spent about four or five years up there. Had a great time. I mean, it was good people. It was a great folks being in the military at that time uh at that time was a great job you know i was making decent money as a a guy in my early 20s running around the job was nice because you only had to work like eight days a month you know so the rest of the time you're off you know skiing chasing girls around stuff like that you know that was uh that was what i did for about four or five years and so that was that was a fun time but yeah we were we were the guys there was a movie called war games that came out in the I guess it would have been the 80s or something like that. You know, you guys, you're basically down underground in a launch control center, and there's two guys, and basically you spend 24 hours there, and you got, we had 10 nuclear missiles that we were, we were, we were up, well, sometimes up to 50, depending on what day it was, but you had all these nuclear missiles that were there, and, you know, you're just ready to go. If, if you know, some guy says, hey, if, you know, the president says, hey, guys, time to go, then you'd be the guys that did that. And we did, you know, we did a lot of test launches and, you know, we had all these drills and stuff like that to pretend we went to war. And uh, it was, it was pretty interesting stuff. I enjoyed my time. Uh, but like I said, the people were really good. But, uh, you know, I, I did that for, like I said, about five years and then, then went decided it was time to go back into medicine, which, um, because I left medical school, I was, you know, I was like 22, graduated from college, went to medical school, started playing rugby, got really good at rugby, got offered to go play, you know, professionally down in New Zealand. I just, I just said, I'm going to leave medical school. So I did that. And then I went back, uh, you know, seven or eight years later after playing rugby, because I was like, okay, I'm tired of getting my head kicked in. I'm going to go back and, you know, go back to medical school. So I've always had kind of a weird career path where I kind of do these sort of different things, which is kind of what I'm doing currently as well. Mm-hmm. Did I answer everything? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but uh, just what's what's something you'd like to talk about that nobody ever asked you about? Um, perhaps you know your current YouTube uh, endeavors. I noticed you're picking up your activity a lot on there. Um, great videos, by the way. I really enjoyed the one a couple days ago um, where you actually did the uh, actual meal prep. Uh, that was very helpful. Okay, I can't remember if I did that or not, but uh, you, well, yeah, I mean, you too, I'm putting a little bit more stuff out there. I, you know, like I said, my goal is just to reach as many people as possible, you know, and it's kind of funny. I, I, uh, you know, we attract a lot of vegan, vegan hatred, which, you know, I, you know, that, that's fine. I mean, they, they, I fully expect them to do that. And the funny thing about that is the more they do it, just more publicity and you know, the more people come in and take a look and what they're seeing is what I'm seeing is people getting really healthy. You know, when they, when they look on my Instagram page and see that every day I put some guy or gal that's tremendously improved their life, their health, their conditions, their weight. So, you know, it's just it's just uh, another uh, avenue for reaching out. But, you know, I will tell you, you know, a few years ago, if you had asked me about social media, I said, stupid. You know, it's a waste of time. And, and, you know, why are you doing that? And I think there's still a lot of, there's a lot of silliness that goes on. A lot of people just calling each other names and just, just ridiculous, stupid stuff. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you're getting a message out there. You're reaching people. You're getting information from a lot of people. And this is a thing that we can, we can really move quickly. Whereas, you know, if we want to do a, a you know, if you want to fund a university study, that's two, three, four, five, six, ten years in the making. And a lot of people don't have time to wait for that. You know, if you're if you've got some awful, you know, autoimmune disease, you know, are you gonna wait ten years for them to figure this stuff out? Or are you gonna say, hey, wait, there's ten people that did it and they got better. Maybe I'm gonna try it. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. But I think that's you know, I think that's a way to, to move the needle a little quicker. And I think, you know, if you use it correctly, um, it is uh, a very good tool, and I and I know, you know, like I said, some people will sometimes criticize me because sometimes I'll I'll say some kind of crazy stuff. I'll make fun of some vegans and stuff like that. And it, 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 what it does is it just drives, you know, attention. You know, and some of that, you know, if we if we look at our last presidential election, you know, the guy who won is the guy that got the most attention. And I think there's a, there's a lot of value in, you know, you got to entertain people before you can educate them. And if you've got the best messages in the world, but nobody hears it because no one cares, nobody's going to see you, you're never going to see it. And so am I going to put up a photo of, you know, yeah, this the latest YouTube killer was a vegan. 
Sure. You know, and, 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 and say, yeah, nutrition plays a role in mental health. And that's all I said. Now, people are going to say, ah, you know, it's crazy that you would do you. How dare you say that? You know, you know, I, again, mental health has a lot to do with nutrition, you know, and whether it's a vegan diet or a crappy junk food diet, if you're not getting en- enough nutrition, your brain doesn't work as well. And, if it, and, you know, not every vegan turns out to be a shooter, obviously, nor does every junk food eater. But I think if you find these people that you put them on a better diet, and I cannot tell you how many people tell me when they go on a carnivorous diet, their anxiety goes away, their depression goes away. I've seen it time and time and time again. And so pointing out that, you know, maybe diet has a role in mental health, I don't think that's outrageous. But the fact that I that I say, hey, vegan shooter went in and you know, and I didn't say she was a vegan. I mean, basically the news did. You know, that's what they that's what they said. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm going to put up some controversial stuff, and I fully expect some people to complain about it, call me out about it. You know, you know, I get ta- I get attacked every day. Believe me, you know, people wishing I'm dead. You know, every name in the book. That doesn't bother me. You know, it doesn't bother me at all. all it, like I said, all it does is. Uh, Again, create more traffic, create more attention, and that's fine. And that's fine because I think what we'll find in the end, people are going to find the results are what count. And people are going to see these people are getting unquestionably healthier. You know, and, and, and I think, you know, it doesn't take, you know, someone with a great deal of training to say, that's good, that's bad. And, you know, we have people that are sitting there explaining stuff to us and, and try to make things very complicated and, you know, try to say, well, this study says this, this study says that. Well, that's true, but that study didn't have me in it. You know, that study had something else and some other uh, variable that, that didn't really affect me. And so we have to uh, take all that stuff with a grain of salt. You know, we've got uh, so much stuff out there that we don't know yet. And there's people out there that think they know everything and try to tell you they're the expert. And anybody who's truly an expert will tell you, I don't know it all. I certainly don't know it all. I'll tell you that for sure. And the people that think they know it all, or they read a couple studies and think, oh, yeah, we, we know it all now, are, you know, that's that's just a sign of someone who is, uh, you know, uh, very amateurish, you know, because you're not going to, we're not going to figure out nutrition for a thousand years, in my view. You know, as far as trying to find out the perfect diet. Now, what's going to happen with industry? Industry is going to try to force us to eat the same thing. You know, those little, those little foam uh, sound things you have behind us. They're going to turn some food that looks like that and, and fill it with some nutrition. Give you these little bars like you see in these science fiction movies. That's what they want us to do because it's very cheap. It's very profitable. And if they can give you a little you know, a Soylent bar or whatever they want to call it, you know, here's a bar that has all the chemicals you need to survive and you eat that and it's fairly cheap and we can make it for five cents and charge you three bucks for it. That's what's going to happen. And, you know, I think we're going to end up with people that are, that are alive. They're, they're not, you know, they're not thriving, but they're not, they're not dying because we've got this massive amount of people to feed and the way to do it, you know, the way we are doing it right now is importing all these cheap grains. You know, that's what, you know, we do in the U.S. We, we import all our cheap grains out across the world and it's not helping people. I mean, it's, it's just clearly making them sick and fat and chronic disease, but they're not starving to death. And so the question is, what's the lesser of two evils? Do we let people starve or do we make them fat and sick and have chronic disease? Or is there another, is there something else we can do? And I think there is, but that's a, you know, that's a long road and there's got to be the will to do that. Well, Zan, you have any final questions? No, I think that's a good place to wrap it up right there. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Um, it was truly an honor to have you. Uh, thank you for your service in the military. Um, and thank you for spreading your message and helping people get healthy. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, tell people to check out the, the, the various social media stuff. You know, we can we can get, spread the message. I appreciate you guys having me on. And let's see if we can get uh, University of Arkansas to go partly. I'm sure they got a big vegan uh, crowd on at the university there. Where you can have a little carnivore team. <laughs> All right, guys. All right, guys. All right, take care now. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Life of Podcast. Check out the links below for more information.